But he was never told he was under arrest. Now, Detective Cassie told you I told him he was under arrest right before I pulled out the handcuffs, OK? I think his facts were mistaken. I don't like to call anyone a liar because I don't think anyone's trying to purposely mislead you. But you heard how important it is to put every detail of what happens in a report. And he's a very experienced officer. He knows what he's doing. He didn't write that in his report. And that's an important fact to recall for court. I think he's remembering it wrong, members of the jury. I think he told the story incorrectly. So John never knew that he was under arrest. Now, when you're looking at the jury instructions, when you go back to deliberate, and you keep in mind what the judge told you as far as these go, the last line of each and every charge is if he was not privileged to act and self-protection. That day, John, under those circumstances, certainly was privileged to act in self-protection. Because he thought that somebody was trying to hit him. He didn't see blue lights. He didn't see a badge. He didn't even see a turn signal. He thought these guys were going to go straight across and that he was free to crush the street. All he was doing was minding his own business. When the policeman almost hit him. Not on purpose, fair enough. But when they stopped and decided to call John's bluff, that's when they created the situation, members of the jury. And John didn't know any better at the time. John was just defending himself. He ended up with a broken nose. He didn't do a very good job. But because he was defending himself, I'm going to ask you guys to go back and deliberate. I'm going to ask you to consider all the evidence and the rules of law. And I'm going to ask you to find John Masters not guilty. Thank you for your service, members of the jury. Mr. Price. Thank you, Your Honor. I'm staying behind this podium while I'm going to take the king from me. Sure. Your Honor, Mr. Price. Counsel, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, let me first start by um, saying thank you. Uh, and of course, uh, as the prosecutor in this case, I appreciate your time and consideration, uh, the attention that you have paid to the, uh, the evidence, uh, the testimony in this case. Uh, throughout the uh, duration of this trial, these short two days, if you will. Um, and I'm going to try to keep this as short and simple as I possibly can. Uh, th this is A case that makes you wonder at times whether you're in a Kentucky courtroom or a Florida courtroom. When you listen to this case and when you hear the evidence in this case, Throughout this case, what you heard, even from the defendant, from the uh, defendant, 
was that he walked up to this white car to throw punches. Plain and simple. That was his intent. And I'm going to tell you why he did that in just a second. But I want to point out a couple of things before I do that. You heard Mr. Master say today that he was scared, that he felt threatened and angry by this unmarked car that had approached him. Yet in this scared state of mind, this defendant decided to address these individuals and provoke them, saying, F you, that he was scared and he didn't know how to react, but he decided to react in a violent manner and attack the individuals in the car. I want you to keep in mind one important fact here, that when you look at these instructions, ask yourself, all of this talk that we're having about the police and whether you knew it was the police, does it really matter? When you look at the disorderly conduct charge and a menacing charge, does it really matter? It doesn't matter who was in that car. Could have been me. Could have been my son. Could have been my brother. Could have been my sister. Could have been my mother. He was going to approach that vehicle because he was angry. Let me tell you why he was angry. You've heard the testimony. He was angry because his girlfriend and him were not on good terms. Ironically, that evening, he told the detectives that he felt that she was leaving him. So he was going to, he, was leave, he left the house, and he was going to go out and get, a, get himself a drink. He says a beer and a snack later on. When he takes the stand, he says, it's a Friday night. She should be going out with me. She's not going out with me, so I'm upset. So immediately, you have to assess his state of mind. His state of mind at that time is that he's not happy. He's not happy. So he gets to the intersection of 4th and M Street, and the police, doing what police do, responding to this robbery call, they get the tone, it's not a robber, it's, not, it's in a different division, it's not your division. And they make this turn, and you know, they simply ask him to get out of the way. Now, that's a factual dispute. He says, they say, get the fuck out of the way. But unequivocally, he says, fuck you. Okay? And even when the car came around, he didn't get out of the way. Okay? And then when the car came to a standstill, he felt it was necessary and important for him to then approach this vehicle before Detective Cassie, who we know now was in the driver's seat, before he could get out of the vehicle, the door. And he's wailing on it. He told you that. How do you claim self-defense with that? How do you claim self-protection with that? This defendant lives in his own world. And he wants to put us all in his little world. Ordinary, reasonable individuals law-abiding citizens, when they hear the shouting police, police under these circumstances are going to take a pause. 
Ladies and gentlemen, they're not going to simply entertain with all this adrenaline and all this stuff going. They're not going to entertain this thought, oh, these guys really police. I'm going to keep fighting these guys. I'm going to keep resisting these guys because they're not really police. I only know that they're police in my mind when I see the facial expression. You know, almost like a neon light. Police, police, police. That's not what reasonable people do, ladies and gentlemen. I mean, this defendant was upset. He left his apartment upset. Left his apartment to cool off. And of course, Detective Cassie making that U-turn did not help him cool off. And he thought, you know, I'm already upset. Here's an opportunity. I'm going to take it out. So here's an opportunity for me to take it out on this guy. And when he sees Detective Cassie, partially gets out. He's already approaching the vehicle. And a light bulb goes off in his mind. You see how tall he is. And you see how short Detective Cassie is. Oh, I can take this guy. He did not retreat until he was struck in the face when it was necessary to strike him in his face. He did not retreat. And the whole time he's resisting. Police, police, police. Detective Browning, police, police, police. How do you entertain in your mind that this man is not a police officer? You take this visual and you take Audible, police, police. Not John Masters. Nope, they're not police. I'm going to keep doing it. John Masters was determined that he was going to fight the police when he left his apartment. He was determined to do that. You heard him say that he was tired of people messing with him. So he decided to take matters in his own hands. He clearly placed these officers, particularly Detective Cassie, in an immediate position of danger and physical injury. And that's why he is guilty of menacing. You're going to have this exhibit when you go back there. I mean, you're going to have a photograph of the uh, defendant also, but you're also going to have where he struck Detective Cassie. You know, how, how do you, think that you can approach someone and they not have this reasonable fear that they're going to be injured? This is what police officers do, ladies and gentlemen. When circumstances like this happen, and they see an individual in the middle of the street who doesn't move, and they have to go around him in a busy intersection. Everybody has said that 4th and M Street is a busy intersection, and he's standing there like this. What do we expect police officers to do? To drive on, not to stop? They're obligated to stop and inquire and investigate what was wrong with this person. Is he OK? That's their duty. That's what we pay taxes. And that's what our, our, our tax dollars expect that they would do, is not to leave somebody who, who appears to be deranged. They don't know because they're inside the car. He wants you to think that they had no right to get outside of the car. Of course, he did not give them an opportunity to get out of the car. He demonstrated, and I know he demonstrated on this side, but this is what he did. Just like this, before he could get out. And he's wailing on him. And Detective Cassie tells you that then he's protecting himself, and based on his training and experience, he's pulling him over as much as he can. Detective Browning gets out of the vehicle, and he yells, police, police, he still doesn't stop. 
Is this fighting in a public place? Absolutely it is. Should he claim self-defense for that? 